to our night service, and uh, we're going to ask that you to stand, please. And then we have a Bible, and we will turn to Psalms 30. Psalms 30. Psalms 30, prayer of thanksgiving. Psalms 30, can you have it let's say amen? Psalms 30. Amen. Psalms 30 and it reads, I will bestow thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and has not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of hills, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endures but for a moment, and his favor is light. Weeping may endure for a night, for joy cometh in the morning. And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dead praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever and ever. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, we bless your mighty name. We thank you, Lord, that you are a good God. And you are worthy to be praised. And this evening we come before you, Father, Father, with praise and thanksgiving. We thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your precious Holy Spirit. And, Father, we just come to give ourselves to you, to yield to you, Father, that you may use us as you see fit, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for breathing on us and giving us life, Father. And, Father, we just say this is your service, Father. Do what you desire to do with it, Father, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for your anointing tonight. Your anointing that destroys every yoke. Your anointing that removes every burden. We thank you for ministering to our hearts. We thank you for giving us just what we need, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just say yes to you. Yes to your way, Father. And Father, we just give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Joy comes in the morning. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Sunday night service. Thank all of you who have joined us tonight. We are glad to have you with us. Yes. And again, tonight we will have our own deaconess, Stephanie Tagawa, who will yes, be bringing us the message tonight. Amen. And so let's welcome her with a clap of hands. So, Father God, I just thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for all who have pressed their way into this house, Father God, yes, to worship you, Father God, and to hear your word, Father God. Yes, they could be at home relaxing, but, Father God, they chose to come yes, and yes, seek Lord. you this night, Father God. Yes, so, Father God, see their hearts, Father God, and answer all their prayers, Father God, this day. Lord, we ask that you hide me behind the cross, Father God. I ask that you decrease me and increase you, Father God, as I bring your word, Father God, touch every heart and let every seed fall on fertile ground in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, lukewarm love or obedient love. And I'll be uh, going everywhere, but the main scripture is going to be coming out of Matthew 22, 37-39. And i got um, two versions I'm going to read out of. Uh, the first version I'm going to read out of is out of the New King James Version. And um, it reads, uh, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I found this new version on the Bible app called the Easy Bible Version. And it reads like how it says, I'm sure. It says, he said, teacher, which of God's laws is the most important rule for us to obey? Jesus replied to him, you should love the Lord your God completely. Love him with all your mind. Love him with all that you are. Love him in all that you think. This is the greatest rule and the most important of all God's laws. The second rule is also important. Like the first one, you should love other people as much as you love yourself. Yes. I'd like to briefly uh, tell you what took place before this great commandment was spoken from Jesus himself. In this previous chapter, the high priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, together known as the Sanhedrin, were hammering Jesus with questions so that they can convict him of any crime possible. Before we go on, Let's look at the description of what these leaders' jobs were back in that day. The high priest, um, the first appointed high priest we find in the Bible was Aaron in Exodus 28, 1-3. The Lord commanded Moses to consecrate his brother Aaron and his sons to minister to the Lord in the priest's office. Aaron's descendants served as the high priest in Israel ministering in the tabernacle and later the temple primarily as mediators between man and God. The Levitical priests bore the responsibility of offering the sacrifices required by the Mosaic law, which you can learn more about if you read the book of Exodus and Leviticus, so that's a homework assignment. <laughs> the Sadducees, sometimes historically called Zadokites, are thought by some to have been founded by a man named Zadok. In the 2nd century B.C., in 1st Chronicles 16, Zadok was named the first high priest in the time of Solomon to, Solomon to serve in Solomon's temple. <coughs> Another school of thought is that the word Sadducee is related to the Hebrew word Sadak, meaning to be righteous, and they thought they were really righteous. They tended to be wealthy and held powerful positions, including that of chief priest and high priest. And they held the majority of the 70 seats of the ruling called the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees preserved the authority written word of God, especially the books of Moses, which are in Genesis through De Deuteronomy. While they could be commended for this, they were not perfect with their doctrinal views. First, they were extremely self sufficient to the point of denying God's involvement in everyday life. 
They denied any resurrection of the dead. You can find that in Matthew 22, 23. They denied the afterlife, holding that the soul perished to death, and therefore denied any penalty or reward after the earth, earthly life. And you can find that in Acts 23, 8. They denied the existence of a spiritual world by angels and demons. And that's also in Acts 23, 8. Summed up, the Sadducees were, as Pastor Bobby used to say, they were sad, you see. <laughs> uh, moving on to the subject at hand, uh, before Jesus was being hammered with questions from the Sanhedrin to trap him, we see in Matthew 21 through chapter 22 that Jesus had made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, which was fulfilled from the prophets in Isaiah 62 11 and Zechariah 9 9. Jesus cleansed the temple and turned over all the tables and threw out all who were selling in the temple as if they were in a flea market, reminding them of the written word in Isaiah 56, 7 about them making a den of thieves out of his house of prayer. After Jesus healed the blind and the lame, the children praised Jesus in the temple and shouted Hosanna to the son of David. That made the Sanhedrin angry and they questioned if Jesus could hear what the children were saying. Jesus responded with a quote from Psalms 8-2, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise, then left for Bethany. Jesus then gives the disciple a quick lesson to teach them about a fig tree with no fruit. Spurgeon commentary reads that the tree resembled the nation of Israel. The tree was full of leaves as the, tree, as the Israel nation was covered with abundant religious profession, but there was no fruit. For the people neither holy nor true, nor faithful toward God, nor loving their neighbor. In the same lesson, he taught them about asking the Father in faith and receiving and believing for the things they ask for in prayer. All the way up to the key verse of chapter 22, Jesus teaches in parables while being under a microscope and always being interrogated by the religious leaders. I chose the word interrogated because they were trying to find reason to charge Jesus with any crime. Even though they saw everything in the law prophesied in Jesus with any, uh, excuse me, even though they saw everything in the law prophesied in Jesus' ministry fulfilled, they denied the Lord. Yes. They were just religious. Uh -huh. Keep all this in mind. It's all in time to get our promise. <laughs> now then, remember when you stay in the Lord's will as Jesus, our Lord did, you will be under a microscope. People are always watching you, reading your every move, most of the time just to see if you mess up so that they can have a reason not to become a Christian or to throw accusations about your bad witnessing through the life you're living. They will do it to your face and behind your back. So be careful to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. On that note, how have we loved the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind? How have we loved others as we love ourselves? Keep your answers between you and God. I'm going to ask questions that you need to answer yourself and be honest with yourself in doing so. Questions that you need to remember, God and you are the only one who knows the answers. Oh yeah, and the people who are watching. <laughs> are we being living sacrifices for God? Are we living with each other as Romans 12, 9 to 21 reads? And I'm reading this as a new living translation. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in, are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Yes. And don't think you know it all. Amen. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. 
leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead of your enemy, instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Yes, amen. According to these scriptures, we need to keep it real with each other and not be fake. Mm. Don't be friendly with each other on any level. Keep it real. Love each other genuinely. The way you speak to each other face to face should be the same way you talk about them when they're not in your face. These scriptures also tell us to work hard for the Lord. Don't be lazy. Stop waiting or thinking that someone else will do the work you know you can do or that God himself called you to do. Get up, ready to do the work for the Lord with enjoyment. Enjoyment. I want to add, just like I said earlier about not being fake with one another, do not be fake in doing God's work. Don't do it if, if it seems like it's a hard chore or task or just to be seen by others and be in the limelight. And don't do it without a willing heart. Remember, God knows your heart better than you know your own heart. Amen. Pray about it. Be quick, but be quickly to respond to whatever the Lord calls you to serve him. It's a way of worshiping, worshiping him when we love him. Amen. It tells us to be confident in our hope and rejoice. Our hope is in the risen Christ Jesus, who was raised. He who raised Jesus is also the same. Excuse me. He who raised Jesus is also the same one who lives in you. And because he lives in you, you have the power to raise up above every circumstance. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 40, 31 says, When we hope in the Lord, we will renew our strength, and we will soar on wings like eagles. We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not faint. This is encouraging, mm -hmm. knowing that hope will get us through every opposition that may come upon us as we do the Amen. work of loving God and each other. Amen. There is a lot of instruction in the scriptures that speaks on all our Christian ethics of loving each other. Are we rejoicing when others rejoice? Or are you jealous and coveting what others are rejoicing about? Are we weeping with those who weep? Or do we excuse ourselves from visiting those who weep because there is no compassion in our heart to feel the hurt of our brothers and sisters? Are you living in peace as much as possible with all men? Are you kicking it with the with the in crowd and leaving those hanging who are not looking and talking like the in crowd? Are you trying to get even with someone who has wronged you or betrayed you? I believe this is part of trying to live in peace with all men as much as possible. We must allow the revenge to be left up to God, Amen. trusting him to deal with those who wrong you Amen. and pray for them. Feed them. Give them a drink. Allow the Lord to deal with them. If you're plotting to get even with them, you are allowing evil to overtake you. Do good, brothers and sisters, and overtake evil. Amen. Part of loving God and others as we love ourselves means we also need to take away all bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, and all desire to do evil to someone. We need to be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God forgave us through Jesus Christ. Amen. The New Living Testament uh, translation in Revelation 3, 1 through 3, reads, Jesus speaks to the church in Sardis and tells them, I know all the things you do, and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believe that first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as, as unexpected as a thief. And that was Jesus speaking this to the church. Tell me this... To me, this means we need to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Follow some names. <laughs> he tells us to wake up. Don't live for reputation for the world like we see the Sanhedrin did in the gospel. We are not to conform to this world. We are to renew our minds. 
We are to renew our minds daily. We're instructed to go back to what we first heard about the Lord and hold firmly to it. We need to repent from all, all forms of self-love and promotion. Remember the grace that was given through Jesus on the cross. Repent, church. Do as God commanded us. Amen. Love him with all our heart, mind, and soul. Love others as we love ourselves. Reading down in the same chapter of Revelation, chapter 3, and verses 15 through 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus is now talking to the church in Laodicea. Help me out, brother. Laodicea. Laodicea. There you go, that one. That's it. What was the scripture? Revelation 3, 15 through 18. Thank you. Jesus is now talking to the church of what Pastor said. <laughs> <laughs> he tells them, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with the eye salve, salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Here again, I want to first look at that command to repent. This is important. Because he is speaking to us, the church. Yes. The church needs to repent. From what? From being lukewarm. Yes. Again, self-evaluate yourself. Another important fact to recognize is this. If Jesus is speaking to the church and he says you are lukewarm and is threatening to vomit you out, the easy Bible version translates, instead of vomiting you out, he is ready to throw you out completely. In the book Crazy Love by Francis Chan, he asked, when you read that passage, do you naturally conclude that to be vomited out of Jesus' mouth means you are a part of his kingdom? When you read the, these words, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, do you think Jesus is describing the saints? When he counsels them to buy white cloths, clothes to wear, to cover their shameful nakedness, does it sound like advice for those already saved? I thought people who were already saved were already made white clothed in Christ's blood. The conclusion here is Jesus wants all or nothing. And I'm going to come off my notes and I'm going to read some examples in that book that I told you guys about, Crazy Love, that he was giving as examples of what lukewarm is. So I'm going to briefly go through some what he said because I felt like I needed to share it with you. Lukewarm people attend church fairly regularly. It is what is expected of them, what they believe good Christians do, so they go. The Lord says, these people come here to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of only rules taught by men. Lukewarm people give money to charity and to the church, as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. If they have a little extra and it is easy and safe to give, they do so. After all, God loves a cheerful giver, right? The scripture says, as he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in, put in all she had to live on. And that's in Luke 21, 1 through 4. Lukewarm people are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they do not act. They assume such action is for extreme Christians, not average ones. Lukewarm people call radical what Jesus expected of his followers. The scripture says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. And that's in James 4, 17. 
Lukewarm people love God, but they do not love him with all their hearts, souls, and strength. They would be quick to assure you that they try to love God that much, but that sort of total devotion isn't really possible for the average person. It's only for pastors and missionaries or radicals. <laughs> Jesus replied in Matthew 22, 37, 38, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Lukewarm people are thankful for their luxuries and comforts and rarely consider trying to give as much as possible to the poor. They are quick to point out Jesus never said money is the root of all evil, only that the love of money is. I'm sorry, Jesus never said money is the root of all evil, only that the love of money is, is the root of evil. Untold numbers of lukewarm people feel called to minister to the rich. Very few feel called to minister to the poor. And the scripture says, Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you, since creation of the world, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for me, of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Um, I think I got one more hand, two more. Lukewarm people do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so they never have to. They don't have to trust God if something unexpected happens. They have their savings account. They don't need God to help them. They have their retirement plan in place. They don't generally seek out what life God would have them live. They have life figured and mapped out. They don't depend on God on a daily basis. Their refrigerators are full, and for the most part, they are in good health. The truth is, their lives wouldn't look much different if they suddenly stopped believing in God. And the scripture for that is a long one. Uh, so Luke 12, 16 to 21, and Hebrews 11. Um, I'll read that last scripture to you guys. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will restore all my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich for a body. And that's the last one I'm going to read for now. There's a whole bunch of that. Crazy Love, right? Crazy Love by uh, Francis Chan. So, are you giving all to him? Think about that. Are you giving all to him? Where or what is your time spent on? Who are you loving the way God loves, despite the wrong that is done to you by them? Or how they look, maybe tattooed and sleeved up, piercings all over their face, or with dirty, stinky clothes because they're homeless and they ain't got nowhere to shower or wash their clothes. Let's not be religious like the Sanhedrin were. Let's take every blessing the Lord has blessed us with and love those as we love ourselves and bless the less fortunate with God's love. Amen. Let us obey God's commands and love him with all our heart, soul, and mind. Then, I'm sure all the kingdom work you do for the love of God will come with joy and be effortlessly as we rejoice in all he does with his yielding blessing. Amen. Okay, God. Amen. Thank the Lord for each one of you 
And while we're here tonight, I wanted to see if anyone here needs prayer. We want you, I don't want to just stand up here and pray for you. We want you to come forward and we're going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray for you. Because we're not just meeting and greeting. We're here to minister to one another. So is there anyone who needs prayer tonight? Come forward. Elvira, yes, you come forward and have us pray. Don't pain. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus. We serve a good God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even when we don't 